My title is Senior Vice President of Leadership and Team Intelligence. Ooh. How are you, my friend? I'm very good, thanks. How about you? Amazing. Today's a beautiful day. In what part of the world are you in? We are in Florida. Oh, there you go. Okay, yeah. so what, what's the weather like down there right now? It's pretty horrible. <laughs> I'm just having a good day. <laughs> <laughs> You're just having a good day. All right. So yeah. don't look out the window is the answer. Correct. Yeah. It's, or don't go out. Yeah, don't we, step outside. We get that um, that island effect where in the summer it's stormy and hot and muggy, but uh, you just do your best to to keep a positive attitude. It's funny. I used to be on a in a past life. I used to be in a project in Miami. I was in Miami every Monday for like a long, long time. And you could set your watch by the thunderstorm at three o'clock every afternoon. That's right. That's right about where we are right now. It's just getting yeah. ready for it. Yeah. It's getting ready for it. We should probably get it in 24 minutes time, actually. Yeah. Where are you at? I'm in uh, Montclair, New Jersey. Very cool. Is that where Cisco's headquarters is? No, we're, the headquarters is uh, San Jose, California. So I have a home office here and I have an office office in San Jose. And, and then um, United Airlines likes me. You have lots of points? Yeah, lots of lots of points. Always going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. So I do good work on planes. Otherwise, I think they'd have fired me a long time ago. <laughs> well, so just so you know, this is the interview. It's just you and I hanging out talking. There's no big yeah. intro or anything like that. Uh, I was just scrolling through LinkedIn one day, and I saw a post. I'm not sure if it was about the book you had recently done, but I came across your profile. I started digging into you, and I was like, this person quite possibly loves leadership as much as I do. <laughs> there we go. There we yes. go. So I said, we have to talk to him. Well, it's a great pleasure to chat. And, you know, you just fire away with questions and I'll keep talking and you tell me when you've had enough. How about that? That sounds great. I want to take it back. Like, we, we've, we know that there's an amazing book and people can find that. And we'll ask some questions about the book. But I want to know more about, like, your origin story, right? I saw a little bit about music and I'm, I'm curious... Um, was music your first love? Was technology your first love? Oh, really clearly music was my first love. I actually grew up, think, grew up thinking I was going to be a musician. That was the first career I actually landed on and thought, oh, grown-ups seem to do that. I could do that. Um, I played from the age of, I think, five or six, the piano, uh, which I still play. Uh, I then added to that, and so this will give you a sense of the music geekery in my early years, um, I added violin, then viola, then pipe organ. Um, then I would sing, then I started writing music, and then I played in orchestras, and then I finished up conducting orchestras and learned an awful lot about um, leadership, although I didn't necessarily know I was learning about leadership at the time. I was just learning about how people play together and what the different roles are. Um, but I learned about leadership for the first time, really, in hindsight, by... Um, being the leader of a symphony orchestra, which I got to do for a year um, when I was in undergrad. Um, then I think a fairly circuitous journey through um, designing concert hall acoustics. So I did actually, you're in, you're in Florida, I worked on uh, the Performing Arts Center in Miami um, and worked with Cesar Pelli actually on the acoustics for that. Uh, then a career change, then an MBA, then human capital consulting, then HR, then more and more leadership stuff, learning stuff, performance management became very interesting in about 2015, um, all of which led to the role I now have at, at Cisco and, of course, writing the, the book that you mentioned. So what do you exactly do at Cisco? Um, so my title is, um, which I mentioned because it's, a, I think, a, at least to me, interesting, um, Senior Vice President of Leadership and Team Intelligence. And what we did at Cisco now four years ago is we put together a new organization, one of a kind, as far as I know, in HR organizations around the world, uh, the mission of which was to figure out how we could do everything possible to build more teams like our best teams, more leaders like our best leaders, and do all of that while providing people with reliable, real-time intelligence about the world they lived in. So there's this really interesting fusion of the leader and the leader and the team and the leader and the team and the information about the world that they live in that for us is 
a really, really important area of investment and curiosity and innovation. I am just massively intrigued <laughs> because you've got this wealth of knowledge. I wanted, I wanted to be like, what did you learn? <laughs> but I'm, I'm curious, like you wrote this book, Nine Lies About Work, to sort of what set the record straight about common misbeliefs? Um, I think to help us in a way get out of our own way in the world of work. And, and there are many things, and of course we've written about a lot of them, although I think we could probably come up with some more, but we wrote about a lot of them in the book. And they have this sort of characteristic that the leaders of an organization with all the best intentions in the world try and um, tidy up, if you like, the mess of work. They try and tidy up, you know, we're worried that people aren't all working on the same thing, so we're gonna have a cascaded goal system. We're worried that um, people don't understand what the company is for, so we're going to talk about culture at a high level a lot. Um, we're worried that our people need to grow and develop, so we'll tell them what a uniform ideal of performance is, and then we'll tell them where their gaps are. And there are many other examples of these sorts of things. And, of course, if you're on the receiving end of those, none of them is particularly helpful. Because down in the trenches, in the teams doing the work every day, firstly, you know exactly what work you've got in front of you because your team is connected to the world, your team is connected to your customers, your team is connected to other teams inside the organization. Um, it's not hard for smart people to figure out which things should demand their attention on any given day. And so when the goals come cascading down on you, like if you like uh, toxic rain, um, you're, you're sort of like, okay, what, what's this for and where am I in this? Where am I in this? When you are measured against a set of competencies and you get your scores, you have two reactions. The first reaction is, um, what, where do those scores come from? Because that's not how I understand myself from the inside. And secondly, why are you all hopping on about the bits of me that are least useful to the world? Why aren't you focusing on the bits that are the most useful to the world? So I think the impetus behind writing the book was to say, look, we've designed the world of work as though certain things are true. If you push on them and you look at the evidence and you look at the research, you find that they are not true. They are lies. And we are going to be hamstrung in our efforts to build workplaces that nourish and support the people in them until we can get out of our own way. I love it. I've come to this. So we, we did this podcast. I don't know if you know about this part of it. I'm going to share a little bit to give you some context and I'm going to ask some more yeah, questions. Sure. So we did this podcast and then leaders were giving some pretty great advice about how they grow and mentor and do different things with their teams. And then we ended up creating these leadership challenges where people go do things with their teams. And then it, did pretty well, started to take off. And then we started realizing that we have to sell to HR as we grew a sales team and all of this. And then HR was like, okay, well, we need to do this like 360 survey. And then we need to find out like where their different, all their areas and their skills gaps are. And what I real, and then we need to measure before and then like three months after. And what I realized when building this measurement system is that the way I'm going to measure as an individual is highly dependent on my current mood. And that's like a really hard way to show improvement or results. Well, it's funny. I mean, there are things, what's interesting is you can measure somebody's experience of work if you know how to do it. And that experience can and does change and is changeable. But unfortunately, uh, the way you do it is not a 360. And the way you do it is not a manager rating. And the way you do it is not an assessment with 53 questions. Um, and the way you do it fundamentally is not to ask other people what they think of Joel today, because you get a whole bunch of noise and not very much signal. Uh, in fact, specifically, none much signal. Um, the way to do it is to say, Joel, what's your experience of work today? And the questions I ask you to define that should be questions that I know from prior research lead to or predict your um, performance, predict your innovation, predict your creativity, and on the other side, predict whether you're going to stay or leave a company. So there are ways to do this, 
but in a way we've massively overcomplicated the design of work and how we do these sorts of things. And there are some very simple truths in how you actually measure a human's experience of work. And when you get the simplicity right, then you can do all sorts of other interesting things. But when you, when you wrap the, when, as, as you've discovered, you're trying to do some good in the world and help leaders. Um, and if what you have to do first is cut through this sort of thicket of 360 and then this, and then this other thing, and then this other thing, um, you never emerge from the thicket. Yeah. I, I just, I don't think that people can reliably like rate other people and that should come. Yeah. They can't. I mean, it's, it's, it's absolutely provable. And by the way, it's not a new, this isn't like breaking news. People can't rate other people. This is like 20 year old. News. But you would think it for me, it was like, I, I, when I saw that on the list, I was like, look, everyone look, it's on the list. Like, cause we found it to be true, but then you go out in the world and everyone acts like it's not true. Well, I'll tell you what, I'm, I mean, everyone acts like um, they have a thought about other people, which is true. We all have thoughts about other people. Um, but our thoughts about other people aren't the truth of the other people. They're, they're only the truth of our thoughts about other people. And yet when we design our, it, it's almost like, um, if you think about tennis, it's almost like our measurement systems are always us jumping over the net into the other person's court and trying to play the game for them. Whereas what we really need to do is stay on our side of the net and go, look, my, my experience of you is this. Now that's good data because I know what my experience is. I'm a reliable witness, Ooh. if you like, of my experience. But I don't know anything about you. I know nothing about you, and I can't come to know anything about you. All I can do is understand my own experience. Now, that means we can measure, but we've got to stop measuring by jumping over the net and opining on what other people are like and whether they have strategic thinking and execution and business acumen and all of the other um, weird and abstract things we try and measure in people. Um, we got to stay on our side of the net and describe our experience. What that looks like is, uh, you know, would I always go to Joel for excellent work? That doesn't tell me anything about Joel. It tells me about me. But if you add that up, you now know about the people around Joel and their experience of Joel. That's not nothing. It's much more humble, um, but it's actionable as well. That is really interesting. So like the framing is very important. I like how you, that's a small, subtle difference, but it's very important. Well, and it connects, you know, in the book we write about feedback as well. And of course, feedback is another case where we just keep jumping over the net. Let me come over the net and tell you what you need to do. Uh, tell, you, tell you how you should do this differently. Tell you how you should do this better. But of course, those things aren't actually, um, they can't, know how you should do something better. They can only know how I would do something better. Um, but yet we jump over the net, we trample around in your head for a little bit, and then we give you, and then we tell you off because you haven't done anything differently. And you're like, didn't you get the feedback? And you're sitting there going, the way that you think about this stuff is completely different than the way I think about this stuff. And you have no idea how I think about this stuff. And you can't live a day in my head. So the most useful thing for you to do is stay on your side of the net and give me your reactions to what I did. Then I, can, then I can gauge my impact in the world. Then I can figure out from my sense of who I am and what I'm trying to do, how to change those reactions. But you gotta stay on your side of the net. Now I'm always trying to grow and improve as a leader. Should I be going deep into my strengths or should I try to average out and be well-rounded? Um, you, um, you can sort of take your pick. Um, uh, if you want to thrive as a leader, you're never going to get there by becoming marginally better at the things that you suck at. <laughs> um, I love it. And, and the evidence for this is look at leaders in the real world. Um, now, again, in companies, we like to tidy up leadership and we like to say every leader should have the following list of characteristics. And, you know, we arm and are about whether authenticity is more important than vulnerability. And while we're sort of grinding on all of that lot off in, inside some darkened room somewhere. Meanwhile, there are actual leaders out in the real world and they're leading. We know they're leading because people follow them, which is the only thing that characterizes a leader. Um, yeah, that's my John Maxwell right there. I love that. There you go. 
you got no followers equals no leader period in a conversation. And so uh, you look at people with followers in front, they're not, they're not at all well rounded. They have colossal deficits, but they've all figured out something that they're really good at doing uniquely good at doing in many cases. And they've understood over the course of a lifetime, how to refine that, how to make it more powerful, how to make it more visible for people across the world and how to use that to give people something to hook onto. Um, we talk in the book about spikes and really when you look at the best leaders, you find they are beautifully spiky. Um, they, they have, they have understood themselves. They have understood what they have going on with such great clarity that they know how to magnify that. Um, and the corollary of this, by the way, which I think many listeners will will recognize, is that leaders are actually slightly annoying people <laughs> because we still see the faults and yet we follow and we know in ourselves that we're following you despite your faults. Um, we're forgiving your faults, if you like. Following is an act of forgiveness. It's not going around going, I'm not going to follow until I find a perfect person. It is, however looking at the world and looking at the people around you and going, my God, that person over there has this amazing talent. I want to be part of that. And at the same time, they're not very good at this and they occasionally miss on this. And those things are going to frustrate me. But for me, the trade is worth it. I'm going to hook my wagon to yours because of what I see that is so magnificent about you. And I'll forgive you if you like your trespasses. What are your strengths? Um, I'm a distiller. Yeah, that, that's why I like you, man. <laughs> that, that sounds like I spend my time um, in an inebriated state. Um, <laughs> but actually, I'm not so much talking about that. Um, but I, I, I've learned that what I can do is I can look out into the world and I can see patterns and I can make them simple and clear for people. And that if I keep doing that and keep doing that and keep doing that, that clarity is useful to other people. And so a lot of my, a lot of my um, spikiness as a leader, if you like, comes from being able to say this, not this, this, not this, this, not this, and do so over time with a heightened sense of contrast and a greater sense of clarity. So what I do is I distill things and in the distillation, um, I serve others. Oh, I love it. I have this thing I call it the three R's, reduce, refine, repeat. Cause like, I'm just, I noticed that I constantly, I used to build applicate like software app, large software applications. And so I'd go into an industry I knew nothing about. I would consume everything in the world about insurance or financial products, build out this entire system, solve all these problems, make everything really, really, really simple. And then go do that in a whole nother industry. And I found out that like my superpower is just consuming large amounts of data, simplifying it down as basic as possible. And everyone's always like, Ooh, uh, <laughs> sorry. And that, and that sort of clarity is very hard one. I mean, it's not, it, it's not, um, you know, I think many of us at work crave for greater simplicity and, uh, very few people run around going, you know, it would be great if things were a little more complicated because <laughs> things are more than complicated enough. Um, but the simplicity is hard won. Um, it, it's, not, it, it's not a trivial matter to be able to go, you know what, folks, it's not feedback, it's attention. That one thought, don't give people feedback, give them attention. Don't give people feedback, give them reactions. Those are, um, you know, the beautiful, th the beautiful thing about anything that's simple, that's well done is when you encounter it, you go, oh my goodness to me, that makes perfect sense. But you couldn't have thought of it for yourself. And the, you couldn't have thought of it for yourself bit means that somebody has really been grinding on what are the, what are the differences in detail? What is the essence of something? And then how can we clarify that essence for people? Do you pace or like walk around when you're thinking? Um, or when you're writing and trying to refine ideas? 
it's for me it's not location specific or sitting or standing specific but i do do this thing where i'll have a conversation with somebody about something and i'll know that i've i'll know that i've sort of gotten half the thought out and then the conversation will finish and then i'll just keep ruminating on it so i am i think a little bit of a post conversational ruminator as a new category of person for the world <laughs> um it's one person in it thankfully and you know half an hour after the conversation i'll go oh that's that was the thing i was trying to capture that was the thing i was trying to frame um and a lot of my um most useful insights come in the rumination after a day or after a conversation so right right now you're at cisco you're studying and leading and figuring out all of this about the the best teams what are we know some feedback something that well let me not answer that for you let me say this what are some of the patterns that you're noticing between your best teams and your best leaders the um the best teams seem to be able to solve for two things they seem to be able to solve at least this is according to all the research i've ever looked at including research i've done at cisco um they have figured out their leaders have figured out and the team together has figured out how to see and value the uniqueness of each person teams are actually great individualizers there's a beautiful paradox there by the way in order to be seen as an individual for who you are the best way to do that is to group with a bunch of other people who see you for what you are so first thing is teams are individualizers and then secondly teams create a common understanding of how we support one another and what matters most to us which is a universal thing so teams manage to live in the they manage to make powerful the tension between an individual and a group they manage to make that not friction but amplification they manage to make that something where individuals can thrive because the team thrives and the team thrives because individuals thrive and um the best leaders know they have a role to play in that that it's a significant role and that it's not an exhaustive role in other words the team has to solve certain things for itself and the leader can help but the leader can't get people all the way there uh by themselves starting to remind me of the conductor right you can't play well, all the instruments again. right yeah yeah and and you know the thing the thing that i learned um conducting a symphony orchestra i mean the the thing that's sort of glaringly obvious if you think about it for a second is the product of the orchestra is sound and the conductor is the one person who doesn't make any by definition so the product of a leader and a team isn't made by the leader the space to make it is made by the leader the possibility to make it is made by the leader the environment to make it is made by the leader but the making is done by the team and um there's a there's a there's a moment in conducting at the beginning of a piece where you stand either in rehearsal or in performance you stand in front of the orchestra and you give the downbeat and of course at the bottom of the downbeat you don't actually know for sure that anything is going to happen and um you know they might all not play now you've practiced it and there's a sort of general agreement that you're going to do this and they're going to play um but it reminds you in that nanosecond that the doing of the work isn't the leader the doing of the work is the team the making of the space for the work is the leader and i think you can translate that all the way through to what we know about teams at work um the leader can certainly give attention to each team member to what it is that's unique about them the leader can certainly bring the team together and say let's make sure we understand what we're confronting together let's make sure we talk about what matters to us let's make sure we have a conversation about excellence let's make sure that we support one another but the team leader can't actually do any of that they can frame it and emphasize it and point to it but then it's for the others to do it or not No, I I'm, I'm sorry. I'm like I I love this interview. <laughs> it's one of my favorite ones ever. Dude, you kill it. How, do you do a lot of talks around the world? Do you speak a lot about this what you've learned? 
Well, I have to say that, um, you know, the book, uh, the book was out uh, beginning of April and, um, I think it's touched a nerve. I think, I think, um, I think lots of people have read it and gone, thank goodness somebody is beginning to say, not this, this, not this, this, not this, this. Um, so yeah, I've been asked to, I've been asked to, Marcus, of course, my co-author has been asked um, to give a number of speeches, presentations, podcasts, media interviews. The world is, the world is very interested in what we're trying to say. And that's really heartening for me because I think these things have needed to be said for a long time. Well, it's things that like we find true inside. We just need someone to articulate it in a way with a reputation and uh, a level of credibility that allows us to not just try to sell it internally, or we can actually point to some third party reference that, Hey, this is actually. Well, and yeah. And the evidence as well. I mean, we went out of our way, you know, I'm a, I'm, I lead a bunch of research at, at Cisco. Marcus is a researcher by, by profession. Um, and so we went out of our way to make sure that we were following as closely as we were able to all of the evidence that we could amass on a particular topic. So uh, for folks who haven't read the book, we range across research into engagement through to neuroscience, through to soccer, through to uh, Elon Musk and Tesla. Yeah. We, we tried to, we tried to give people not just a polemic, which is relatively easy to do, but actually a fresh look at the real world of work informed and guided by everything that we know to be true about the real world of work. Because if it's founded on evidence, then we can rely on it and we can, we can act on it. If it's, a, if it's one person's point of view, um, then that's just there with every other person's point of view. So uh, the evidence is a really important part of what we've done. What did you learn about Elon Musk? Um, well, I probably shouldn't give away the reveal for everybody oh, no. uh, who hasn't read the book. Um, but when you, um, when you look at somebody like Elon Musk, what strikes you? Um, there have been all sorts of articles saying, goodness me, Elon Musk should calm down and he should stop smoking pot on podcasts and he should <laughs> stop doing this and he should stop doing this and he should stop doing this. The world seems very eager to tell Elon Musk what's wrong with him and what he shouldn't do. But then you say, well, what has he done? He's founded uh, multiple companies that now have valuations in the millions and billions of dollars. He's reinvented the automotive industry. Uh, he's reinvented the space industry. He's re on his way to reinventing solar power. He's, he's thinking about hyperloops. Um, if instead we get out, and, and you know, it's a great it's a great case in point for how we actually react to one another at work day to day. We're so easily drawn to, oh my goodness me, stop doing that. If only you would do this, you would be better. That we lose sight of, where's the human there? What can that person do brilliantly well? How do we magnify that? And um, you know, it's a truism that people don't change very much. We talk a lot in organizations about change. Um, but if you look at a human over the course of their lifetime, the big bits don't change very much. The question always when we're, when we're dealing with people at work, and certainly when we're leaders dealing with people at work, is not so much how do you put in what isn't there, but how do you draw out what is there and make that useful and powerful and focused? Um, and how do you help people build their own impact in the world based on their own uniqueness in the world. Give me a little bit of like a more like an action thing. Like let's say I'm a leader, a leader is listening. They want to, to help their team a little bit. Like what's something they can actually do? Uh, here's one. Uh, and this one's great fun. And what you need is a pad of sticky notes and a few pens. Okay. So it's cheap exercise. Um, you give people two sticky notes each. You, you sit the team around. You can do it virtually or you can do it co-located. And um, you say to each team member, uh, on the first six sticky, write the words, come to me when. On the second sticky, write the words, don't come to me when. 
and then fill in the blank. So everyone goes around and goes, all right, I, I would like people to come to me when you need something put in a database that needs organizing and you're struggling with Excel and Excel hasn't got enough rows and columns and anyway, you can't do the relational stuff. And so come to me when you want somebody to sort through your data and somebody else will go, come to me when you've got a tricky problem with a teammate and you can't see your way through the fog. And then you keep going and you keep going and you keep going. And sooner or later, the following marvelous thing happens. Somebody else goes, don't come to me when you've got an Excel thing that you need turning into a database. Or somebody else goes, don't come to me when you've got a thorny problem with a team member because that drains the living daylights out of me. And you figure out how to trade. Um, and just giving a team visibility into, with completely free choice, what each team member would like to volunteer to the team and what each team member would not, in the best of worlds, want to volunteer to the team is a marvelous exercise in individuality again and also makes transparent to everybody that, look, if you move a task from this person who's drained by it, doesn't, don't come to me when, to this person who's energized by it, come to me when, the work still gets done, but now you've got from zero energized people to two energized people just by moving a piece of work. And no one needs to give anybody permission to do this. All you need is the information. All you need, if you like, is the intelligence. Um, so that's, that's a fun place to start. That was amazing. I, I completely unique. I've never heard that one before. I've, thank you. Have, have you like, so then the follow-up question to that is how do you deploy that exercise across teams at Cisco? Uh, well, uh, we use a combination of technology and human interaction, if you like. And by the way, one of the things that I think is most important in the world of technology at work is that we don't lean too far into purely digital things and we don't lean too far into purely human things, but we try and figure out where's the productive intersection between those. Um, so we do a couple of things. Uh, everybody at Cisco has taken an assessment called Standout, which is a strengths assessment. And you go into our technology and you can actually digitally complete the sentences, come to me when and don't come to me when. Um, you can share them with your team. Um, it's actually more useful to do it in a live setting, as I've described, because there's something present tense about it. There's something about the trading and the bartering and the insight that occurs in a group in real time that's very powerful. But the other thing that we do with our, with our technology is um, every week, every team member at Cisco does what we call a check-in. They go into the technology and they answer a few simple questions. What do you need from your team leader? What did you love and loathe about the prior week? And if you're, you're, you're getting it, love and loathe is the same sort of things as come to me when and don't come to me when. It's my emotional reaction to my work. Um, and then what are your priorities for the following few days? So the team member gets to go, all right, here's the world as I see it. Here's the world on my side of the net. This is what I'm focused on. This is what I need. This was my emotional experience of work last week, which we know, by the way, is important. And then the team, they, they hit submit, the team leader gets them all. Um, and you can see online what each person needs from you if you're the team leader. Uh, you can comment. But then, of course, what you do is you have a live conversation. So now we go from the digital to the human and the, the check-in online serves as a template, if you like, for a conversation. And it's critically, it's the conversation that starts on your side of the net. It's not a one-on-one -on -one where I go, tell you what, Joel, it's our time again this week. I've got a list of 18 things I need you to do. Please sit there, write them all down, nod your head and get on with it. And I hope they're all done by the same time next week, which is a conversation that you actually aren't a part of. You're just sitting there listening and doing as you're told. Um, this is the inversion of that. This is to say the team leader doesn't make any noise. The team leader isn't, isn't making the music. The team member is making the music. So we've got to start by understanding what the part is, what their score is, if you like, what they're going to play next week, and seeing whether we can help them shape that in some way. Um, and you have to do it weekly because the world changes daily. 
if you do, if you have a, if you have a conversation with anyone on your team once a month, and we actually have data on this, they get less engaged because attention has a half life. And if you get wonderful attention from somebody once a month, then you spend three weeks going, where the hell have you gone? That was kind of good when you paid attention to me and asked me about my work and my priorities and my loves and my loves. Um, where did you vanish to? Now I know what I'm missing. And now I know you could do it, Mr. Team Leader, if you tried and you've chosen not to. And so I think less of you as a result. Um, the best technology for team leaders is frequent attention to the world that each of the team members is living in. And when you get frequent attention, you unlock all sorts of magnificent things on a team. How do you take these learning, you know, there's the book, but like, have you taken the software or the concepts and made that like divested them in a sense to where the open public can consume the product or is it just? Yeah, I mean, the, 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 the software is made by ADP where Marcus now works. Oh, um, great. What's the so software? Anyone, anyone can get hold of the software and the market is called Standout. Standout. Um, yep. And, um, you know, what's lovely is that it doesn't really require permission from HR. Obviously, if you want to do it at the scale of the enterprise, as we've done at Cisco, we, we adopted it. Um, we've helped shape the design of it. And we've rolled it out to um, 74,000 people globally, 15,000 teams. Um, but if there's a team leader listening who says, look, I don't want to wait for this, or I'm not sure this is coming, you can go and get a license and you can buy licenses for your team and you can, you can have them um, interact and do check-ins and, and learn about one another's strengths um, right now. Do you find that this, this ability to to meet with people weekly and then your research of the half-life of the information, getting this out to leaders, do you think that helps empower them to actually make it a priority? Because it could be like an amplifying effect. I think what leaders hook on to is again, the clarity and the simplicity. What, we've, what we haven't really done to a very great extent is teach people how to have a good conversation. Um, now, there's, there are plenty of HR organizations that will sit you down and say, here's a course in active listening, or here's a course in empathy, or here's a course in... We haven't said any of that. We've said, get the frequency right, and the rest will follow. If you do this 52 times a year, there's a pretty reasonable chance, unless you're a complete idiot, that the 52nd time will be better than the first time. Um, and of course you're doing this not 52 times with one team member, you're doing it with the whole team. I do 400 checking conversations a year. And you learn how to do them with each team member. Each team member wants a slightly different conversation. Some want short, some want action item focus, some want to talk about broader issues like development, some want to run through their list, some want to start with your list. Um, you, you learn by doing it and the, the most important takeaway, and by the way, we have evidence on the power of frequency, like the more frequent up to about once a week, the more frequent the conversation, the higher the engagement. Um, but we've, we've learned that the frequency is the magic thing. And um, many, many, many team leaders at, at Cisco have been able to grab a hold of this and been able to say, okay, I'm, you know, I'm trying to be a great team leader. I need tools to help me to do that. I need insights to help me to do that. And this is simple and I can do it and people love it. So I'm going to keep doing. So that, that's good. That's good research for the people who like the leaders who are like, I'm busy. That sounds like it would be nice to do, but I've got to do these other things to hear that from you. And that's your experience in such a large data set that if, if they just take the chance, right. And they just try implementing this and do the frequency and see the reason, you know, maybe commit to like doing it for three months straight to see the results, right? Every week. And that would give them some, I'm trying to help transition the people who are like optimistic, but slightly doubtful into actually doing this so they can see the benefits for themselves. Help me sell that. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'll tell you. So the, the first thing that you run into, as you said, is I, you know what? I don't have the time. I'm a busy leader. I got stuff to do. I don't have time to pay attention to the people on my team. Certainly not on that frequency. They're all grown-ups. They can look after themselves. Um, 
is roughly the caricature of, of what you hear, to which the response is precisely what do you think the job of a leader is then if it's not to activate and understand and shape your team? It's like the symphony conductor saying, I'm too busy to conduct today. I've got other things to do. You're like, no, that's your job. The job of a leader is to build a great team. Okay, after you're done with that, by the way, which is a thing that is never done, after you're done with that, then by all means, turn your attention to other things. Um, we have to help team leaders understand that the team is the number one priority, not the number eight priority. It's not what you get to after the other stuff. It's what you get to before the other stuff that makes the other stuff easier. And you're going to spend the time anyway. Spend it in a way that has leverage, if you like. The best leverage for a team leader is always building a great team. Um, so for folks who are sitting on the sidelines going, you know what, I'm not sure I've I can do this. Try it. Firstly, you can. You don't need technology to try this. By the way, you can have everybody send you an email on a Monday morning, saying, um, you know, answer the questions. Here's what I need from you, boss. Uh, here are my top five to six to eight priorities for the week. Here's what I loved and loved about last week. Anyone can do that, um, and then commit to have a conversation about it. Um, try it for three months, and you'll find you can't live without it which is very, very interesting. There is something addictive about the rhythm of attention in a high-performing team that becomes the connective tissue. And it's very, very hard in the world to find connective tissue. Uh, we try and impose it on people, and it hasn't gotten us very far. The connective tissue of a team is attention to what matters to each team member. And then from that, to be able to have a um, a sense as a team together of what matters to everybody. Oh, this is so good. I'm so happy we got to like have you come on the show and do this because it's like, it's such good information and it's, you know, moments like these episodes like these that like, I just, it, it reignites like all the reasons why, why I'm spending time doing this and helping get this, these words out. I suppose the, the overall, the overall message here that I'd ask any listener to take away is um, that sometimes in life we're very lucky because doing the right thing and, and doing the generous thing is also to do the smart thing. Um, and in the world of individuals at work, recognizing that we all have certain strengths it's not only the right thing to do because people are different, it's also the smart thing to do because that's where we're at our most productive, where we make our greatest contribution. In the world of teams, paying attention to people and what they need is not only the right thing to do, it's the smart thing to do because in that, you activate the energy of a team of people together. Um, so I'm, I'm an optimist, of course, and I have great faith in humanity and great faith in the individuality that each of us brings to the world. But even were I not, it is still the most pragmatic, down-to-earth, hard-nosed business decision that any team leader can make to pay attention to the people on their team. Oh, I love it. Yes, you made it cool. <laughs> <laughs> That's what it is. You made it not lame to be a good person. That's just what you did there. It's, 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 my God, it can't be lame, can it? What's no. wrong with us if we think it's lame to exactly. be Exactly, right? I love the way you can articulate it. It's, it's, it's beautiful. I have to ask, and we can cut this last part from the interview if you would like, but I'm so curious to know, like how do you manage or coach or how do you work with the leaders who aren't using the system? Um, well, you have them, the, you know, the best thing to do is have them try it and hear from their, their team members. I haven't yet met, met a team member who, who um, has said, oh, I want less attention. At work. <laughs> right. I don't really want attention to me. Um, humans don't actually work that way. Uh, so you can have folks try it. Um, you can, of course, show them the evidence. You can, of course, explain to them the neurochemistry of attention and how we grow human brains grow under attention and under positive attention. Um, 
you can have their own leaders do it for them, which is extraordinarily effective because when you experience this as a recipient of frequent attention to your work, you very often get what that is and, and it's very easy to give it to others. Um, and ultimately, you set it as an expectation. We've set an expectation for all the leaders at Cisco that they are doing check-ins and they are responding to check-ins. And right now, I will tell you that uh, north of 92% of the check-in online submissions at Cisco get a response either in a comment or a conversation from a team leader at Cisco. So we, we have an attention rate now organizationally that is enormously high. And what that means is if you, um, if you come to Cisco and you submit a check-in, you're going to get attention. So, so now, we, now we give our people, we give our, our team members um, the mechanism to get the helpful attention they need to the work they know they need to do. No, I love it. I, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pause the interview for a second because I need to understand. So I'm really driven with creating better leaders and we have you know over a thousand leaders on our platform and we have about like a 50% engagement rate of people doing these actions like week over week over week. And so we've become obsessed with like how we make it easy to improve people, things like that. But so what I'm curious to know is like, it's not like a hundred percent of people doing it like week over weeks. So like how do you keep them engaged? You just keep putting the positive in front of them. Or like how, how do you, how do you as an individual, as the leader of these teams of performing teams at Cisco, like how do you look at the people who aren't doing it or are dropping off? Like, how do you deal with that? We study them. You just study them. We, we get curious. Yeah. We do research into what, why don't you, you know, we, we, we go and interview people. Why, why isn't this working for you? Why isn't this something that you're interested in doing? Um, the truth is always out there in the world. You can't jump to conclusions. And um, so, so we spend a lot of time trying to understand why people who aren't leaning into the ecosystem aren't leaning into the ecosystem. The stuff that comes to the top of the list is um, when I do it, my team leader doesn't respond, which is not very good. Um, or interestingly enough, my team leader and I talk the whole time, so I don't need the digital bit because I've already got the human bit, uh. um, which I need to understand better because there is, of course, a structure to a, to a conversation that's informed by our technology that says you really should talk about needs, love, loads, priorities. And that's a useful structure, and you can hit that in 15 minutes if you're good. Um, but those are some of the reasons. But the, the, the short answer is we go and ask people. Yeah. We, By the way, because we're researchers, we collect a representative stratified sample of people who aren't engaged, and then we go uh, measure and, and interview within that. And we use that to inform how we communicate, how we design the platform in the future um, so that our future path is set both by those who are using it, which is what we pay most attention to, but then also right. by those people who have yet to um, fully jump in. Thank you for that. Like, yeah, we're on the right track. This is what all of our innovation has come from day one. Like how do we help make it easier for people to become better and just constantly talking to people about why they drop off and, making improvements according yeah, and the, you know the thing not to miss is why are the people who are using it using it right um look for the look for the positive deviance positive deviance is a really interesting thing and is usually more valuable in designing something than negative deviance right so i'm pretty clear that my responsibility is to help the team leaders at cisco who find this useful my responsibility is to help make it even better and more powerful for them. And then secondarily, right. to figure out how to bring more people into the fold. Because if I do it the other way around, I'm optimizing on the wrong thing. I need to optimize um, for the people who are really into being a team leader, who've understood what that means, who relish that responsibility, who are geeked out by the fact that everybody's different. Um, if I can keep innovating and, and providing a, a useful and powerful and easy to consume experience for them, then that will necessarily make it easier for some of the people who are on the sidelines to jump in. I love it. No, that was very, very useful. I re extremely respect your input and advice. Thank you so much for 
for like sharing and coming on and hanging out on the, on the podcast. It's been a, it's been a lot of fun. Well, it's been great fun chatting. I hope this was uh, informative for your listeners and um, I'd encourage people to check out the book um, if, uh, if they're interested in finding out more. And so they can get it on Amazon maybe, or Amazon, oh. wherever books are sold and there's an audio book as well. So if you like, listening to me then you can listen to more of me and if you don't like listening to me then the print version will remove you from that particular experience well if they don't like listening to you i don't think they would have made it this far in the episode <laughs> yeah, that's true that's true we lost those people a long time ago didn't we <laughs> well this has been absolutely fantastic information super i appreciate that very much very kind of you. thank you so much ashley you have a fantastic day Thanks for watching this interview. I hope it brought you a ton of value. If you liked it, give us a thumbs up. Don't forget to subscribe and leave your thoughts in the comments below. Tune in to the Modern CTO channel weekly for more amazing videos just like this one.